What's going on everyone? My name is Evan Jemnikar and I'm the Daily Dino Guy. In this video, we're going to be going over some of the most recently discovered dinosaurs. I'm personally really excited about this batch of dinosaurs because some of them completely change our understanding of paleontology. So let me know in the comments which of these dinosaurs you think is your favorite. First up, we have Shui Lingornis, which was an, an anti-ornith or opposite bird that lived in China 122 million years ago. This bird was really small. It was only about the size of a modern day dove. As an opposite bird, it had many features that were different than modern birds. For starters, it still had claws on its wings and teeth in its jaws. But just because it had claws and teeth doesn't mean it was a ferocious predator. These teeth would have been extremely small, just barely enough to break skin. And because the fingers of this bird were almost entirely fused together to form a wing, these would not have been used to catch prey. And they may have also just been useless claws. But what's really interesting about Shui Lingornis is that it convergently evolved to look very very similar to a modern day duck. Shui Lingornis was a close relative of the slightly larger bird, Gansus. Gansus was so well preserved that the fossils showed that it had webbing between its toes, just like a duck. It would have used these webbed feet to swim through ponds and lakes in search of food. And now with the discovery of Shui Lingornis, we can see that duck-like birds evolved millions of years before actual ducks did. Now our next dinosaur was actually discovered through footprints. Now these footprints are called Dromaeosaur formipes rarus, and the dinosaur that made them lived in South Korea 112 million years ago. These footprints are only about a third of an inch long or about one centimeter in length. Because they're so small and there's only two toes on these footprints, it's suggested that the dinosaur that made these footprints were a microraptorine. Even though there were no bones associated with these tracks, this is the first time that we have evidence of a microraptorine in South Korea during this time period. These types of raptors would have only been about two and a half feet long or 77 centimeters and they would have been covered in feathers. In fact, both its arms and its legs would have been covered in flight feathers to give it four wings. Paleontologists have always been debating how useful these wings actually were for flight. Because microraptorines didn't have large breast bones like birds do, it's thought that they didn't have the powerful chest muscles needed to power flight. However, this has been a heavily debated topic. Some paleontologists have suggested that they actually use these wings for gliding instead. They will climb up the trees and then glide through the forest eating small birds, mammals, lizards, and even fish. It's also been thought that because its legs were covered in these cumbersome feathers, it would have been extremely awkward at running or even just walking. Overall, it's been very mysterious how these types of raptors moved around. However, Dromaeosaurus formipes is really special because it finally puts these debates to rest. Even though the footprints were only about a third of an inch or one centimeter in length, the steps between these footprints were about a foot or 30 centimeters in length. This is, without a doubt, the longest proportional stride ever recorded for a dinosaur. It's over seven times longer than the longest legged dinosaurs. In fact, it's longer than the stride of any living animal. So what's going on? Well, because we know this dinosaur had wings, the author suggests that this is showing this dinosaur using its wings to take giant gliding leaps, thus showing that at least the smallest raptors could fly in limited ways. Considering that microraptorines only weighed about one pound, or half a kilogram, it's very likely they were light enough to be able to get airborne. But since we only have these three footprints, we still don't really know if these gliding leaps were used to catch prey, run away, or if this was a starting mechanism to take off. Next up were two dinosaurs both found at the same time. These were Magnus Avis and Avisaurus Darwini and they lived in Montana 66 million years ago. These were some of the biggest opposite birds to ever exist. Both of these were actually able to reach up to the size of a modern day red-tailed hawk. And what makes these birds special is that they're a great case of convergent evolution. Both of these birds belong to a specific group of enantiornids called Avisaurs. The first species of this group, Avisaurus archibaldi, was found to have an opposable toe claw. Just like modern birds, it was hypothesized that this opposable toe claw helped it perch in trees. But with these two more complete species discovered, they realized that avisaurs had really strong foot muscles. In fact, the foot bones looked very similar to those of modern birds of prey. For modern raptors, these strong foot bones held powerful foot muscles, which were used to grip smaller prey. In light of this new knowledge, it's thought that avisaurs convergently evolved into birds of prey millions of years before modern birds of prey even existed. These avisaurs lived alongside T-Rex, Triceratops, and Edmontosaurus. But they also lived alongside 
like many other smaller animals and even smaller dinosaurs. We don't know exactly what these birds ate, but by looking at modern raptors, you can assume that they probably ate our early mammal ancestors. They also could have eaten small lizards or small juvenile dinosaurs like Triarchuncus or Spherotholus. Another newly discovered dinosaur is Lavocania aquilonae. This predator lived in Mexico 72 million years ago. While very little of this dinosaur was actually found, there's enough evidence to show that this dinosaur was a tyrannosaur. Specifically, it's very similar to Lavocania anomala based on its hip and foot bones. This makes sense given that North America was dominated by tyrannosaurs as the apex predators. But the discovery of Lavocania would make this the furthest south tyrannosaurs ever existed. Unlike its close relative T-Rex, Lavocania would have reached 21 feet or 6.3 meters. It also would have weighed 1.7 short tons or 1.5 metric tons. By comparing it to other similarly sized tyrannosaurs, Labocania would have had a bite force of about 5,000 newtons. Well, that's less than a tenth of T. rex's bite force. Because it was smaller in size, it would have been a much faster predator than T. rex. It's estimated that Labocania would have reached speeds up to 24 to 27 miles per hour or 39 to 44 kilometers per hour based on other similarly sized tyrannosaurs. This speedy dinosaur would have prowled the coasts of the Western Interior Seaway, which was an ancient seaway that used to cut through the middle of North America. Many crested dinosaurs shared this environment with Lavocania and were likely its prey. These include Lassirhinus, Tilatophonus, Velifrons, and Coahuilasaurus. Ardentosaurus is another new dinosaur that was found in Wyoming 150 million years ago. This long-necked dinosaur would have reached over 62 feet or 19 meters. This dinosaur was specifically a diplodocine, and like its close relative Diplodocus, it would have had a relatively long tail, even for a sauropod. Paleontologists were able to cut open the bones of this dinosaur to actually measure its growth. Just like tree rings, if you count up the rings inside of a bone, you'll be able to calculate how old this dinosaur was when it died. This Ardentosaurus was found to be about 22 years old. It's estimated to have reached adulthood at around 17 years old. But what makes this dinosaur so unique is that it highlights just how diverse sauropods were in the late Jurassic. During the late Jurassic of North America, sauropods were probably at their most diverse in history. This time and place in North America had about 25 other species of sauropods, seven of which were other diplodocines closely related to Ardentosaurus. There seems to be many reasons as to why this happened. First, many of these species seem to be segregated based on size. Larger species seem to be more prominent in the south, while smaller species seem to be more prominent in the north. Second, while all these sauropods had long necks, all of these necks were different lengths. This meant that some species were able to reach up into the tree canopies while other species ate more closely to the ground. And finally, many sauropods had different shaped teeth. Ardentosaurus likely had peg-like teeth, while sauropods like Brachiosaurus had spoon-shaped teeth. These different teeth were probably adapted to eating different types of plants, which would also reduce competition even further. Now, the next dinosaur is Ameliosaura, which was an ornithopod that lived in Argentina 140 million years ago. Ameliosaura was about 15 feet or 4.5 meters long. It was also an iguanodont, but unlike iguanodon itself, it didn't walk on all fours and it didn't have the iconic thumb spike. Even though it was a pretty big dinosaur, Ameliosaura had unique adaptations to help it run faster. On all dinosaurs is a large muscle attachment on the thigh bone called the fourth trochanter. This is what connects the leg and the tail bones together. The larger this muscle is, the more powerful it can retract its legs when it's running. Now in Ameliosaura, the fourth trochanter is extensive and triangular shaped, suggesting that it had powerful leg and tail muscles. While the authors did not conduct any speed estimates for this dinosaur, dinosaurs similar in size to Ameliosaura are estimated to run up to 23 to 27 miles per hour or 37 to 43 three kilometers per hour. And this speed would have come in handy as it lived alongside the predatory Lahaspinator. Wang Yingluang is our next dinosaur and it lived in China 92 million years ago. This dinosaur was an oviraptorosaur, meaning it would have been covered in feathers and it sported a large beak. It was also pretty small for an oviraptorosaur, measuring only about three feet or one meter in length. Yuan Yingluang is a special type of oviraptorosaur for two very interesting reasons. First is that it had an unusually shaped hip, really long legs, and a fused ankle. All three of 
of these features are pretty uncommon among oviraptor source, but they're actually quite common in wading birds like herons, storks, and flamingos. So, Yuan Yang Long seems to be the first wading oviraptor source. This actually lines up with this part of China 92 million years ago, as it was very hot and humid. This area was filled with extensive streams and lakes, which is perfect for a dinosaur like Yuan Yang Long. Now, the second interesting thing about this dinosaur is that it was found to have gastroliths. If you don't know, gastroliths are small pebbles that are held in the stomach that grind up food for easy digestion. Animals who don't chew their food and eat tough plant material most commonly have gastroliths in them. Therefore, we can safely say that Yuan Yang Long's diet consisted mostly of plant material. But what's strange is that earlier oviraptor source, like Codipteryx, are known to have gastroliths, but later oviraptor source are known to not have gastroliths. The authors suggest that this may indicate that oviraptor source changed how they digested their food over time. However, this might just be because we haven't found gastroliths in later oviraptor source. So only time and more discoveries will help shed light on this potential change in their diet. Moving on, we have Hua Shei Zhoulong, which was an ankylosaur that lived in China 83 million years ago. This armor dinosaur dinosaur was about 18 feet long, or 5.5 meters long, and it sported a massive tail club, just like Ankylosaurus. Ankylosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous were pretty much just like walking tanks. Their bodies had efficiently evolved to withstand attacks from predators, but also attacks from other Ankylosaurs. Recent research suggests that Ankylosaurs developed heavier defenses and their iconic club tail to fight off rival individuals. Just like modern day giraffes, these dinosaurs would line up side by side and take turns hitting each other with their club club tails until one of them eventually backed down. We know this because ankylosaurs have a lot of injuries on their sides, their hips, and their legs, which isn't normal if they were being attacked by taller predators. We can only guess what these fights were over, but we can assume that they were probably over mating rights. Now, Hua Shei Zhoulong is very interesting because even though it lived later in time, it had many features that were like earlier ankylosaurs. Unlike later species like ankylosaurus, who have condensed backbones, Hua Shei Zhoulong had relatively longer backbones, which were not really good at absorbing forces. Additionally, the shin bones and ankle bones of Hua Shei Zhoulong were relatively flexible. This is different than later ankylosaurs who had shin bones that were fused to their ankle bones. This fusion of the lower limbs would have provided more stability when they're dealing and taking blows from other ankylosaurs. Therefore, it seems that Hua Shei Zhoulong was not as well adapted for combat between other individual ankylosaurs. Our next dinosaur was technically found several years ago, but it's been re-examined and found to be two separate species. This is Sorophaganax, and it lived in North America 150 million years ago. Originally, it was thought that this dinosaur was pretty similar to Allosaurus, except that it was much larger, at 36 feet or 11 meters in length. This made it the biggest predator in North America during the late Jurassic period, with second place going to Torvosaurus, which was 29 and a half feet long, or 9 meters long. But recent research is actually showing that Sorophaganax was really a chimera. This means that the bones of two different species were referred to the same species. Paleontologists found that many of the skull and leg bones were clearly from a theropod, but the backbone seemed to belong to a sauropod. So unfortunately, paleontologists had to split these fossils into two different species. Because the original specimen, or the holotype, included the sauropod backbones, this means that the name sauropaganax would go to the sauropod bones. However, it's not quite clear what type of sauropod these backbones exactly belong to. And to make things even more complicated, many of these referred specimens seem to belong to different types of sauropods. Therefore, the name Sauropaganax has been discarded since it can't really be assigned to anything. More research and more specimens are probably going to be needed to figure out what this new sauropod or multiple new sauropods would be. Although the theropod bones were assigned to a new species called Allosaurus annex. Allosaurus annex is essentially the exact same thing as what Sauropaganax used to be, just with a different name now. It still would have been the biggest North American predator in the late Jurassic. As such, Allosaurus annex is estimated to run up to 16 to 21 miles per hour or 25 to 33 kilometers per hour. While this is pretty slow compared to other predatory dinosaurs, Allosaurus annex didn't need to be fast. A dinosaur this big probably hunted sauropods, which were very slow and easy to catch. Before we continue, I want to take a moment to thank the amazing people that make these kinds of videos possible. My daily Dino Direct members. Thank you so much for your support and passion for paleontology. Because of you, this channel is able to put out videos that are as understandable and as accessible as possible. If you want to help support this channel and take your dino knowledge to the next level, then you should consider joining Daily Dino Direct. You'll get early access to these YouTube videos and exclusive masterclass lectures from me and other leading paleontologists in the field. Go to my website and sign up. 
Moving on, we have Neva ornis, which was an opposite bird that lived in Brazil 85 million years ago. This sparrow-sized bird is fascinating because its unique skull is a missing link between theropod dinosaurs and more advanced birds. First off, it was toothless, which is pretty uncommon for opposite birds at the time. But it's also uncommon for birds in general, who, for the most part, still had teeth at this time. Its skull was also very similar to many modern birds. It looks very similar to screamers, fluff tails, and gray crowned cranes. The skull even preserved a brain case, which the scientists were able to CT scan and then study the brain anatomy. The authors found that its brain was in a nearly perfect transitional state between non-bird dinosaurs and modern birds. Most theropod brains are long and thin, while many bird brains are short and wide. Neva Ornis had a Goldilocks brain. It was neither long nor short, and it wasn't wide nor thin. Unlike theropod dinosaurs, Neva Ornis had more advanced regions that controlled vision. The regions associated with the sinuses were also way more advanced. Neva Ornis shows that the evolution of birds happened much faster than originally thought, and many things we consider exclusive to modern birds actually showed up millions of years before they even existed. Our next dinosaur was Gondwanax, which lived in Brazil 237 million years ago, making it one of the oldest dinosaurs on our list. It would have been three feet or one meter long and walked on all fours. Gondwanax belongs to a very controversial group of animals called the Scylosaurs. And I say animals because it's been controversial whether Scylosaurs were even dinosaurs at all. Originally, Scylosaurs were thought to be dinosaurs because they had many of the hallmark features. Their hips, thigh bones, and ankles were all very similar to dinosaurs, meaning they would have been very quick and agile animals just like dinosaurs. But other specimens showed that their chest and neck bones were different than dinosaurs. So many scientists considered these to be dinosaur morphs, which were essentially pre-dinosaurs. This has been made way more complicated because many species are not known from a lot of bones. Therefore, it's pretty hard to get a full picture of what exactly a scylosaur is. But the discovery of Gondwanax suggests that scylosaurs actually were dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Not only did the hips and thigh bones of Gondwanax look a lot like a dinosaur, but the neck bones seem to look way more like a dinosaur in this case. Scylosaurs being considered dinosaurs is actually very important because it pushes back the date for when dinosaurs first started to appear. Instead of appearing in the late Triassic, dinosaurs may have actually originated in the early Triassic based on phylogenetic reconstructions. This meant that these early dinosaurs would have been living in the shadows of other bigger archosaurs like Rausukians. Another recently discovered dinosaur was Li Shulong, which lived in China 201 million years ago. Li Shulong was an early type of sauropod called a sauropodomorph, which still walked around on two legs. But this species was humongous for a sauropodomorph, reaching up to 43 feet or 13 meters in length. Some estimates suggest that it could have even reached up to 13 feet or 4 meters high. What makes Li Shulong very interesting is that it's one of the earliest sauropodomorphs to have lived in China. China would have been close to the North Pole of Pangaea, but these types of dinosaurs were thought to have originally in southern Pangaea. This would be roughly modern-day Argentina or South Africa. It's surprising to find Li Shulong in China during the early Jurassic because for millions of years, the equator of Pangaea was very hot and dry. It was so hot and dry that it prevented many plant-eating dinosaurs living in southern Pangaea from migrating into the north. This is because many plants actually couldn't survive in the equator, not necessarily the dinosaurs themselves. With plants not growing in the equator, plant-eating dinosaurs had no reason to migrate. This means that the temperatures in the early Jurassic had to have cooled down to allow the equator to not be so unbearably hot and dry for plants. With cooler temperatures, plants began to grow in the equator and plant-eating dinosaurs began to follow them. From there, sauropodomorphs could migrate across the equator and into new environments like China. And finally, we have Archaeocursor, which also lived in China 199 million years ago. However, this dinosaur only reached about two and a half feet or 75 centimeters in length. Based on similarly sized dinosaurs, it's estimated that Archaeocursor could run up to 16 to 17 miles per hour or 20 25 to 27 kilometers per hour. Paleontologists cut open the bones of this dinosaur to figure out how old it was. They found that it had stopped growing for about three years, showing that it really was just a small dinosaur and not a juvenile. Archaeocursor is unique because, like Li Shulong, it's one of the earliest ornithischians or bird hip dinosaurs 
source to live in China. Ornithischians were also thought to have originated in southern Pangaea and were kept from migrating north because of the hot and dry equator. Once Pangaea cooled, ornithischians would have also been able to cross the equator into new environments. And thanks to Archaeocursor, we do know that smaller plant-eating dinosaurs were able to live closer to the North Pole in Pangaea. Well, that's all the dinosaurs. Tune in next time when we discuss all the other dinosaurs that have been recently discovered. If you made it this far into the video, then you probably love dinosaurs as much as I do. If that's true, then you should sign up for my newsletter. Every month, I gather the cutting-edge dinosaur research and I send it to you absolutely free. Go to my website and sign up. If you enjoyed this breakdown of brand new dinosaurs, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss a new video from me. And don't forget to follow Daily Dino Guy on all social media platforms so you can never miss another fascinating dinosaur fact. Until next time, keep exploring the ancient past with me, Daily Dino Guy.